Now, we're starting a new series today called Christmas Quest, and often in our series, we'll talk about the archaeological evidence for the Bible or the philosophical reasons why what Jesus said might have been true. But we're going to take a different take on this particular series, because many of us are suffering from a lack of wonder in our lives, and the lack of wonder can actually be blamed on the Enlightenment and Immanuel Kent, uh, Kant, because he divided the world into different phases. It used to be folks would say you can connect with truth and connect with God through love and honor, through a great story. I mean, what is it that makes a great story in English? There's conflict. It builds up to a climax and then there's resolution. Why is that? That novels of all places, that's the pattern. It's as if there's something written in our hearts that says that the world is broken and there's conflict and we need someone to come and bring a climax of fixing what's broken and then fix it into resolution. But ever since the Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant and others put a line and said, you can have your own personal beliefs at the upper hand, feelings, they can be true for you, art, right and wrong, novels, religion, beauty. But the only thing that's really true, real facts, are in the lower section, things you can touch, a philosophy called naturalism. But all of a sudden, there's a lot of deep things in our gut that we know are true, even though they're not scientific. Instincts, wonder, imagination, our desire that there would be a world with no evil and no pain, but we've never seen it. Where do those desires come from? I want to imagine with you that there are some longings and instincts and hopes in our heart that speak to greater truths. They can often be found by watching a great movie, reading a great novel, that something speaks to you deep within you that says, this is true. I want this to be true. C.S. Lewis found that to be true. He was an atheist. And yet he loved reading these old novels. He was deeply moved by these old novels and myths that spoke of a God who'd come to earth in the Greeks or, or in the Roman literature and speak about how God would die for them and God would raise from the dead. And he said this. He said, nearly all that I loved as an atheist, I believed to be imaginary. Nearly all I believed to be real was grim and meaningless. And he became friends with J.R. Tolkien, the writer of The Lord of the Rings, who spoke to connecting with God, not just through reason, not just through your five senses, but also through longings, through instinct, and through imagination. So we're going to join together for the next few weeks, and we're going to go on a Christmas quest. And we're going to enter into some novels, into some literature to speak of deeper truths that speak to our hearts about what is heaven and what we're designed for. This December night was a brisk one, the kind where a deep breath is hard to come by. A sheet of snowflakes created a striking image in a moonlit sky above distant white-capped mountains. In the foothills miles below, a young man sat alone in a dark prison cell with no access to the stunning landscape. Tyrion was an orphan. His only memory of his former life was of a vicious break-in, watching his mother struggle and die at the Blade of Marauders. The six-year-old boy was dragged away and sold into slavery. His rebellious nature led to multiple scuffles with his owners. And before long, Tyrion was labeled grudging and defiant, attributes that made him worthless on the slave trade. The boy was cast into jail, left to change his attitude or rot. The days in his cell began to blur into months, and over time, he was forgotten. Tyrion had no friends. No cellmates. An obese and bitter prison guard was his only contact to the outside world. Three times each day, the guard delivered a meager helping of gruel and bread, accompanied by sarcastic insults. Hey, dog, here's your feast. Followed by a bitter cackle <laughs> and the slam of a cell door. Tyrion passed the days by pacing in his cell, partly for exercise, but more to hear the clanking chains of his shackles as they dragged across the stone floor between his feet. The metallic noises were a sort of music to his ears, one of only two diversions to occupy his mind. The orphan's other pastime was devising games with five pebbles he'd gathered and polished to a shine by years of steady play. His favorite diversion was target practice, and he'd learned to throw them with pinpoint accuracy at spots on the rock walls. When not in use, Tyrion carefully stored the marbles in his shirt pocket. This day, Tyrion was tossing marbles one at a time 
focused on the echoing clatter as they landed on the floor. After years of this activity, he knew the sound well. A loud tap, followed by a sharp click, and then the cascading tick, 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 fading to silence. But today, the sound was oddly different. He'd throw the stone, and the click continued. Tap, click, tick, 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 He quizzically threw another stone. Tap, click, and the tapping grew louder. He slowly realized that the tap wasn't coming from his marbles, but from the outside wall of the prison. It was getting louder, and as he examined the source, Tyrion began to see mortar around a brick starting to crack. The tap was now a loud banging, and three large bang, bang, bangs opened a hole in the wall as a brick fell loudly to the floor by his toes. Tyrion was shocked and backed quickly to the opposite wall. Greetings. A pair of bright blue eyes stared in. Come over. I need your help. What, me? Yes. If you push on the wall in front of you while I pull, we can break out some bricks and get you out of there. Get me out? Who are you? Why are you here? What's going on? The first things first. Start pushing. There's a crack in the mortar up to the roof line. I think it'll go quickly with your help. The voice was convincing in its tone, so Tyrion began to push straining to use dormant muscles. That's it, a little more. A crack opened in the mortar, dashing around the bricks, inching outward as they pushed. Their efforts culminated in a loud crash as cold air rushed in through the sudden opening. Tyrion tumbled forward and somersaulted onto his back, landing with a thud. He dusted debris out of his face and squinted up. Above him towered the smiling journeyman with his hand extended. You must be Tyrion. My name is Acker. I'm here to take you home. The visitor was an impressive man. His hulking physique suggested a warrior's bearing, but he beamed an easy smile. Come on. Tyrion grabbed the lad's grip, swiftly standing him upright. I'm pretty sure your guard would have heard that noise. He'll be here quickly. Mind your chin. I'm going to break your shackles. Tyrion leaned back as Acker produced a sharp hatchet, and with a strike, split the rusty chains in two. Let's go. I hear footsteps. Acker took off at a sprint, and Tyrion followed suit. They distanced themselves from the prison, covering a few hundred yards in a dash. At first, Tyrion did well, but now he began to sputter. His lungs burned, and his legs, still dragging the loose chains, began to feel like putty. Dizzy, he collapsed in the dirt. Stop, he gasped. Where are we going? What am I doing? The guide waited patiently. I guess I owe you an explanation. He handed Tyrion a canteen. The orphan drank while Acker explained. Tyrion, years ago, when your mother was killed by bandits and you were taken into slavery, on that tragic day, your father and your older brother and your sister were away in another town working. Your family has been searching for you desperately ever since. And it's taken all these years to, to compile the clues about your whereabouts. Just a few weeks ago, they heard you were imprisoned here and I was sent to guide you home. Tyrion was confused. His childhood was so dim, a distant, foggy shadow. He had no recollection of a father or siblings. He rubbed his eyes, hoping to shake a memory free. I, I, I don't remember. Acker rested his hand on Tyrion's shoulder. I'm not surprised your mind has blocked things out. You witness terrible, terrible things. But when you see your family... I'm sure it'll come back to you, and it won't be long till you're together again. You see, your family members have jobs in the court of the king. They're waiting for you in the royal homeland. I was sent to guide you back in time for the winter solstice. That's the night when everyone gathers for the biggest Christmas party of the year. There's a feast, and music, and games, and the best part of all, the great gift exchange. It's like no party you've ever seen. The orphan thought to himself, I've never seen any party, and couldn't relate to the scene that Acker described. The guide buzzed with excitement as he spoke, but Tyrion found his mind drifting, skeptical that life could be so amazing. Acker's descriptions were interrupted by the sound of heavy feet shuffling toward them in the darkness. The gruff voice of the prison guard shouted from the shadows. Get back here, dog! Nobody escapes on my watch. The two resumed their sprint, going only a hundred strides before Acker stopped abruptly. Workman's Gorge. He pointed at a large gap in the ground just ahead. Tyrion's glance into the opening revealed a deep ravine below. 
The other side of the mountain pass was in view, but it was a good 15 feet away. Acker stepped back a few paces and then hurled himself across, landing with a thud. He sprung to his feet and grinned back at Tyrion. Easy, just jump it. Your guard will never make that leap. Once you're across, you'll be free. Time seemed to stop. Tyrion felt his vision blur as his heartbeat quickened. Doubt flooded his brain. He stared ahead at the guide's outstretched hand. He thought, what am I doing? I don't know this man. He's filling my head with stories of family members I don't remember. He's dragging me away to a place I can't recall, challenging me to a leap that will surely kill me. The orphan found himself retreating. His heels drawn backward toward the prison camp. Tyrion, don't be afraid. The beginnings of your new life are just ahead. No! My cell is home. I've got my three meals a day, my, my games and exercises, and, and the music of my chains. I want to go back. Hacker shook his head. The prison only offers loneliness, hunger, and misery. Tyrion could barely process the choice before a whistling noise sizzled past his ear. An arrow landed with a sharp thunk in the tree just inches behind him. Another one followed seconds later. The clouds covering the moon parted. And Tyrion saw the guard pull a fresh arrow from his quiver. Hacker shouted, It's now or never, Tyrion. Trust yourself. You'll make it. Tyrion was frozen, his feet cemented to the path. He saw the guard steadying his bow, drawing back the arrow into target. Dog, take another step and I'll split your skull. But if you come back to the jail, nice and easy like, we'll act like this never happened. Tyrion turned and looked back toward Acker. The other side of the mountain seemed a mile away. There's something when you hear a story like that, that you get engaged in the story, but it also speaks to greater truths, the sense that we're all longing that there might be a family that loves us for who, are, who we are, that longing for unconditional love. We have that sense when we read a novel or watch a book that something's broken in our world. We weren't made for a world with pain and cancer and devastation. And almost every good movie and every good book, there's a sense that something's wrong with the world and that something needs to be fixed about it. A dream, a hope that a great hero would come and he would break in the door and pull you out and unshackle you from the things that are holding you back. That there's a grand adventure that we're called to, that we're meant for more than sitting in a dark cave and playing with marbles. These longings that we find when we watch a good movie, when we read a good book or a novel, speak to these greater things. Like I said, Immanuel Kant and others, since the Enlightenment sent, you could only find truth at the bottom half. Facts, naturalism, what you can touch, what's physical. And yet things like love, you can't touch love. If the enlightenment is true, then love is merely chemicals. Turn to your wife and say, honey, I love you. And what I mean is there's chemicals produced in my body that are giving me a feeling towards you. Love isn't a real thing. Honor is not something real. It's just something you do for the good of society. But if all of this can encompass truth, then there is such a thing as beauty. There is such a thing as honor. There is such a thing as love. And in our imaginations and in our touchstones to novels, we can actually get in touch with greater truths about the world, about who we are, about our purpose and what we were made for. Albert Einstein said this. He said, if you want your kids to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. J.R. Tolkien, the writer of Lord of the Rings, said in describing why this kind of literature speaks to us, he said the consolation of fairy stories is the joy of the happy ending. But that's not scientific. It's not scientific that usually people get a happy ending, is it? And yet all through culture and all through time, there's a longing for a happy ending, a resolution. Something will be fixed with the prison I'm in. I'll be broken out. That I, I hope there's a better place somewhere. Even though I've never seen it, I sense it exists. He said, fairy tales speak also to the need for a happy ending, or more correctly, the good catastrophe as good overcomes the bad. That there's a desire in each one of us that there is joy beyond the walls of this world we're in. As if in our being captured within a prison of this world, we're made for something more. And the Bible says these are so true. That God placed eternity in our hearts. 
And these longings are because you and I are homesick for heaven, the place we were designed for, the family we were created for, the father we were made for. We are homesick for heaven. To which we go, oh, that's great. But you see, if you're a reader of orthodoxy, it's like, well, no, I'm not a reader of orthodoxy. There's a guy named G.K. Chesterton. He wrote a book called The Ethics of Elfland, where he also spoke to how imagination spoke to him. He said, here's the problem. When you're a young lad, you're filled with wonder and awe and idealism. You come face to face with a business, an older man who says to you, ah, enough with this castles in the air nonsense. Enough with this clouds in the sky. No, no. At some point, you need to get to the place you experience the world for what it is. Stuff the wonder. Get rid of the idealism. Get rid of that nonsense. It's not real. And yet G.K. Chesterton said there was something about novels that spoke to him more than this cynicism of the age. He said, fairyland is nothing but the sunny country of common sense. The only words that ever satisfied me for describing the world, describing nature, were words I found in fairy stories like charm, spell, enchantment, or curse. They express the arbitrary tract of nature. Nature. See, I want to do something, but I can't do it. It's like I'm cursed. It's like the world is broken. He said, I knew of beans before I ever tasted beans. I knew of the man in the moon before I ever saw the moon. A tree grows because it's a magic tree. Sure, there's scientific principles, but there's wonder at watching it grow. There's wonder in seeing an acorn turn and turn into an entire tree. Water runs downhill because it's bewitched. The sun shines because it's supposed to. Sure, there's science to explain it, but there's wonder there. There's a great lesson of beauty and the beast. And that lesson speaks to deep within our hearts something we know. That something must be loved before it becomes lovable. He said, when we are asked why eggs turn to birds, we must answer exactly as the fairy godmother would answer if Cinderella asked why mice turn into horses and her clothes fell from her at 12 o'clock. We must answer, it's magic. There's wonder and longings in all of us we need to get back in touch with. We are homesick for heaven. And the story of Christmas is exactly that. And yet for most of us, heaven, oh, really? So let me help you, even if you don't believe in heaven, let me help you understand the gifts of heaven to understand what the Bible describes as heaven. Because most of us think of the eternal life through the view of Greek Gnosticism, that we're going to be a spirit, we're going to be energy, that we're going to be in a cloud in a know-nothing place. The Bible describes something far different. If you like recreation, if you like football, and you like golf, and you like tennis, the view of heaven from Christian's perspective is that you have a real body in heaven. That heaven is a real place. It's not clouds. It's a real place. The Bible describes it as a new heaven and new earth. So if you love recreation here, imagine your body still able to do what it could do when you were 20. Imagine a golf game that you don't get tired doing. It's hard to play golf with no body. And that's why the Christian view is so unique. You have a real body in a real place. Recreation that you love now, even better in heaven. No more aches, no more pains. Speaking of bodies, the view of heaven is so powerful. You can talk to somebody with cancer or Alzheimer's. The hope you can rub into your grief is the belief that God will give us a new body. And the archaeological evidence for that and proof for that is that Jesus came to this earth and he presented himself with a new body. Last couple of years, I've gotten more excited about this present. The idea that in heaven, I'll have a new body. And with my hair being gone, new hair. <laughs> but for many of us, the longing for a body with no cancer and no Alzheimer's and no pain and no aches. It's a powerful vision of the future. Is it scientifically true? Well, I can tell you a guy who's been there came into history and proved it through his resurrection. But the longing for a place with no cancer and pain, it speaks to something deep within all of us. If you're an animal lover, the Bible speaks about a place in heaven that's like a new heavens, a new earth, where the lion lays down with the leopard and the lamb, that there are animals. And yet now there's no animosity between the animals. There's no animosity between animals and human beings. There really is peace on earth. There really is harmony. Which is why what's so unique about the Bible's description of heaven is the phrase used more often than not is it's a new heaven and new earth. In one sense, Christians teach that you go to heaven, but in another sense, much more is that heaven at the end of the book comes to earth and fixes all that's broken in our creation. No more tornadoes, 
No more hurricanes, no more natural disasters. More than that, imagine a world where there's no more conflict in marriage, no more conflict between friends, no more betrayal, no more misunderstandings. This is why we're homesick for heaven. It's the world we've never seen anywhere in history, but the world we've always longed for and hoped could be true. And the Christmas story speaks to that. It says heaven is near, nearer than you think. Heaven can overcome whatever fear you have. And heaven, if you were to describe in one word, it is joy. It is pure cheer. The heaven-bound child comes and says, heaven is near. And just as the story unfolded a moment ago, there's a dark prison. The Bible comes and speaks and says, and it came to pass in the days of Caesar Augustus. And it was a dark time. And Rome was in charge. And they oppressed the people. People saying, does God care about us? Is there another world? Is this the only world we have where we play with our marbles and we're pushed back and forth by the Romans? It's a dark, dark place. Is there any other world? Was I made for something else? Does anyone care about me? Or is this all there is? And it's into that world and into that darkness that the passage continues and says that she, Mary, brought forth a son. A firstborn son. God himself would come from his realm and sin and come to our realm. He would break through. Where religion is about us trying to get to God, this story is about God coming to us. Into our dungeons. Into our broken slammers. And he comes and he says, I am the hero. I have seen your pain. I've seen your bondage. I've come near. I have left my realm and come to yours. Well, that's a much more compelling. If you don't believe it, it's much more compelling than Jesus is the danger. But this is the sense of epicness in the Christmas story. To which many of us sort of, oh, that's nice. It's a nice retelling of it. But I just can't imagine heaven is relevant because it just sounds so boring. And the way most of us have had it described to us, it is boring. We haven't heard a vision of imagination, a place where there is no limits to economics. There's no limits to creation. There's no limits to imagination. A place that there's not only 1.7 million colors, there are 10.100 trillion colors. And you can taste colors and you can smell colors. There's, There's senses beyond our five that we are yet to even come in contact with. This is the imagination of heaven. And yet most of us think it more like the far side. Remember on the far side? There's a guy sitting on a cloud. <laughs> Wish I brought a magazine. How long can you strum? Really? And some of our wives love worship services, and they go, oh, isn't they so great? Uh, uh, an eternal worship service? I can barely take ten minutes of singing songs. And yet the Bible describes a place of economics, a place of entrepreneurship, a place of imagination, a place with everything that you've hoped and imagined. God says he, he has done unthinkably beyond what you can think or imagine in heaven. The other problem we have is that we've been so influenced by Greek dualism that our second objection is that heaven is immaterial. We're energy. We're passed for the friendly ghost. We're an angel. We don't have a vision. In fact, when, when the Bible, when I tell you that the Bible says you have a real body, you say you can't believe that. You can't mean that. Yeah, that's exactly. You don't have to believe it, but reject it because it's too good to be true. See, the Greeks believed that matter was inherently bad. Spirit good, matter bad. This world was bad. So when you leave, your spirit goes to heaven, but all of matter is destroyed. The Christmas story immediately rejects that because God, who is spirit, came into this world and he put on human form. He put on matter. Matter is not inherently bad. Matter matters. He has a real body. God, man, the God, man is combined. The hero you always long for in every story. The one who is all powerful would use his power not to demand from others, but to serve others, to come to other people, to rescue other people. This is the story of Christmas. Look at his body. He's wrapped. He's laid. He's brought forth in birth. And here God has come to us. And say, I've left my realm to come to yours. And he lives in a real body. And then he dies. We have evidence to show that he died in history from archaeological findings. And then he comes back to life. To which we go, you mean the story came back to life and spread? No. You mean his spirit came to life? Is there a cast for the friendly ghost Jesus? No. Again, you don't have to believe it, but hear what it says. Jesus came back from the dead with a real body. He could come and hug people. He could come and eat honeycomb and fish. For those of you who have parents or grandparents in the hospital and they can't eat. And the diagnosis is that they will never eat again. The hope of heaven is that you will eat again. 
And you will eat with a body at its prime and you will eat a feast that God has prepared for you that will taste like nothing you can ever imagine. Every meal you've ever had times a million is what you can taste in heaven because you taste. Over the years, I've had several agnostics and skeptics on stage. One was my friend Steve. Steve came and we were dialoguing about heaven. And I said, wouldn't you want, even if you don't believe it, wouldn't you want to see your kids and grandmother again? Wouldn't you want to know that when you die, you don't just turn into energy and the person you knew as grandma is now turned into a, a bird or turned into a rock or turned into somebody else? Wasn't there something in you that says, no, no, people matter. They're eternal. They're made unique. They really, I at least want them to be grandma forever. He says, yeah, of course I want that to be true. I said, of course I want to see my relatives again. I said, then check the evidence of what Jesus did. Because if it's true, all those wonders and imagination are true. I was at Starbucks years ago with a friend who's a Christian scientist. And that's not a scientist who's a Christian. It's a denomination called Christian Scientist. It's sort of a mix of Christianity and Buddhism. And so as we were discussing together, one of the beliefs like Buddhism, that ultimate Eternity is nirvana, emptiness, nothingness. You get at one with the universe and you are not an individual anymore. You are connected with the universe. You are nothing and you are everything all at once. A very different view than the Christian view, where you are you for eternity. You are made special. You are eternal. And I said, when Mary Baker, who, who is one of the main writers for Christian Scientists, I said, I've read a lot of her writing. She really liked the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I said, oh, yeah. He said, but disease is unreal, sickness is unreal. I said, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, did he have a real body? He said, well, of course not. I said, well, let's open up to these books that your main writer liked. Look, it says Jesus eating fish. And he's eating honeycomb. And he said, and he was up high up in the leadership of this denomination, he goes, I've never seen that before. Jesus has a real body. Yes. And the ramifications are amazing. I'll come back to that. Second thing we see in the story is that the heaven-bound angels come in and they say, heaven can overcome your fear. And it's powerful. Look what happens. It says that the angel of the Lord, heaven comes to earth. And it speaks us. We want to tell you what it's like over here. We want to tell you about the royal homeland. We want to tell you about what you were made for. We want to tell you what you were created for. You've been living in a dungeon. And the angel stood before them. And look what the angel says. Next slide. The glory of God, the full weight of what the world is like, the full weight of this eternal realm, the weight, that's what glory means, of the Lord, shone around them. They were greatly afraid. Whoa! The angel said to them, don't be afraid. No, no, no. You know what goes on here? Good tidings of great joy. This is the world you always longed for. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. It's Christ the Lord. Boom! And again, a view into the other world. Angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts. Say glory to God in the highest. The God who is high has come to earth. It's every story. It's every movie you ever wanted to be true. Imagine you're God's PR agent. We can say, we've got to tell the people in prison this isn't what they're made for. What do we do? A one-minute trial. A taste, a touch, a look. Let's break, let's, let's put a break in, in a dimension. So just for a moment, they can see from their dimension to ours. Let's break into the wall for just a moment. They'll look in the sky and go, wow, that's what it's like. Joy, power, imagination. And the portal opens. And as they sing about what God is like, they sing about what joy is like. They say, there's fear down in your dungeon. There's no fear here. Haven't you always longed for a world with no fear? We live there. And the heaven-bound child can take you there. He can snap off those chains. Now, it won't be till you get to heaven you fully get them off with that new body. But you can be forgiven from everything you've done wrong. You can be disconnected from this world and know that it is not your home. Don't you want that to be true? I do. See, if you know that you will see someone again, if you know that your body will be fixed. If you know you don't have to cram it all into this life because you have eternity to fulfill your purposes, there's just a peace, there's a rest that speaks to us. Mark Twain had a lot of regrets. One of those was he regretted that he thought he was responsible for killing his son as a young baby. As he came to the end of his life, he said, the burden of pain and care and misery grows heavier year by year. At length, ambition is dead. Pride is dead. Vanity is dead. There is this longing for release 
from this broken body, this broken world that's in its place. I can't get rid of that longing. It comes at last, the only unpoisoned gift earth ever had for them. That they vanished from a world where they were of no consequence, where they achieved nothing, where they were a mistake and a failure and a foolishness. Like, man, that guy gets medicine or something. But you see how honest he's being? This is, if naturalism and atheism is true, that's exactly right. You're nothing more than an accident. Whatever you did, honestly, maybe you have a couple buildings named after you, but in about 50 years, no one's going to know who you are. No one's going to care what you did. Nothing had any consequence or purpose in your life. You get a little flicker, maybe a few people, oh, I think, wasn't he the guy that won the Olympics 20 years ago or something? But if heaven is true, then what you do not only matters, it matters for eternity. What we do in the voice, in the words of of gladiator is what we do in this life echoes in eternity. And it's true. If what the Bible says about heaven is true. Heaven can overcome the fear of death. The over, overcome the fear that this is all there is of this life. It can overcome the fear that God's mad at you rather than seeing that God has redeemed you, broke you forth, pulled you out, made a way for you to get to that realm. It also helps you when you realize I have all the marbles. People told me fame would make me happy. People told me BMW would make me happy. People told me the second home would make me happy. People told me the title would make me happy. But suddenly when you realize you were made for another realm, you realize that you're really living in a dungeon. And even though if you've got BMW marbles, they're still marbles. And you can collect as many as you want, but you were designed for so much more. So much more adventure. So much more purpose. And you start saying, nothing wrong with marbles. I like my marbles. But I'm also okay if I had to lose my marbles. Because something in me tells I'm designed for something more than just the success of this world I live in. Then the angels appear with a third thing, and they say to the shepherds, they say, I want you to know what this place is like. It is pure joy. It says the angels came from heaven. And when they had gone away from them, the portal closes. Heaven is closed. The sneak peek is over. The shepherds said to one another, wow, did you see what we saw? Let us go to Bethlehem. We've got to tell people about this. This thing that's come to pass, this other world, this destiny we have, the Lord has made known to us. He came to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph. This is it. The God-man. Come to rescue us. And it continues. Here's what it says. And when they'd seen him, they made widely known what was said. And they marveled, which really means to be full of wonder. Wow. It's like saying, I knew it. I knew it. This world is not all there is. I knew it. God didn't forget about us. I knew it. He would come and rescue me from my own brokenness and inability to keep my own standards. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I can't help but tell other people about it. I'm not alone. There's another realm. I have a father. I have a family. They're overwhelmed by God's generosity in coming to earth, his sacrifice, his love and his plan. Now, isn't that a different way to think about Christmas? But the question still is, so what? That's nice, Chad. It makes Christmas a little more interesting. But does it really matter? I want to propose to you that it does. I'll give you three real practical ways in which heaven can make a difference in everyday life. Heaven can overcome your sorrow. It can overcome your unrealistic expectations about the marbles in this world. And it can overcome your fear. The first one, how does it overcome your sorrow? Well, much is said about Mary not having room in the inn. Now, think, let's think about that for a second. You're Mary, and it has been tough. You've been on a hundred-mile journey on a donkey while you're nine months pregnant. No kidding that was discomforting. No kidding that was a problem. You come to stay at an inn, and there's no room. Without a doubt, that's not good news. Then you're in a manger, and you give forth birth to your first child and you're holding him in your hands and you realize that the angel what he said is true that you are holding your creator and the mystery of that and the wonder of that that God has entrusted you with this incredible purpose that hundreds of years people have looked forward to this moment and you've been chosen you're holding God in your lap Are you really thinking about the end? 
Are you really thinking about that donkey ride? Or did the joy of knowing you're part of God's plan, the joy of having your first child, the joy of knowing that God has come and used you to change history, would that overcome the discomforts that you'd been on? It would, wouldn't it? Paul says that if you want to use heaven to your advantage, he used it all the time. Paul got shipwrecked, he got whipped, he got beaten. He says, you know what I do? When when I'm living in this dungeon of a world, I realize this world is so broken. But I remind myself, it's just a short little compared to eternity. Look what he does, very practically, he says in Romans, I consider, this is what I do when I'm in sorrow, I consider the sufferings of this world, of this present time, They're not even worthy to be compared to where I was made for, where I'm going, where I'm headed. The glory, there's that word again, the weight of the world I'm made for. We're practical. It's a couple root canals. So you're in pain from from all the dental work, right? So you go in and they're like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to chop off the top of your tooth. We're going to take this drill and we're going to go down into your, oh, oh my goodness, we're showing you a diagram. Like, that's horrible. And so they start working on your tooth. You're like, and the whole time, what are you doing? You're saying to yourself, it's worth it. I'm going to be out of pain. It's not going to be infected anymore. The time of relief that's coming is worth the pain I'm enduring. We said, well, sure, it's easy. When you're at the dentist, it's only going to be a couple hours. I'm talking about life. A dental appointment compared to your life is the same as this life compared to eternity. So when you have sorrow, when you have grief, when you have difficulty, you remind yourself it's but a sliver Compared to the glory. Now, some of you have some huge pains in your life. You would say, Chad, it's like the world has dropped a boulder on me. And I'm not talking a boulder like this big. I'm talking a boulder the size of this building is the kind of sorrow, psychological sorrow, health issues, a rape that you don't tell anyone about. And you would say, Chad, the sorrows and grief I have are overwhelming. And on one side of the scale, you have these sorrows. You'd say, there is nothing that could overcome these pains in my life. Now, I want you to imagine a giant scale where that boulder the size of our building is what you're thinking about right now. And I want you to put on the other side of the scale, it's a long scale, the planet Jupiter. Boom! Because heaven's joy is so powerful, so overwhelming, that it will make even a building-sized boulder... Pale in comparison for what God has for you when you realize how loved you are, how cared for you are, what you were designed for. That's what the Bible teaches. That's how it overcomes sorrow. You begin that discipline of thinking that way. The second thing it does is it helps you overcome unrealistic expectations. C.S. Lewis, in his journey through the novels, Journey to Faith, he started thinking about why is it that all human beings have a sense that this world is broken? You look at history and you say, Mankind's pretty much always been mean to each other. Why do we think that they should act better? That they ought to be different? We've always lived in a world that has sickness and pain and cancer. Why do we think it shouldn't? It's like we're comparing this world to another world we've never seen but we know exists. He says it this way. For we are so little reconciled to time that we are astonished at it. How he's grown, we explain. How time flies. As though the universal form of our existence or experience were again and again a novelty. It's really novel, this world we live in. It's different than I thought. It's it's as strange as if a fish were repeatedly surprised at the wetness of water. How would he know what wetness is if he's always lived in water? We have a sense that this world is wet, as if we were made for a world that wasn't wet. He goes on. And that would be strange, indeed, unless, of course, the fish were destined one day to become, one day, a land animal. We have a sense that this world is wet, and maybe it's because we were originally designed for another world that was not wet with cancer and pain and Alzheimer's and disease. And that's why our longings within us think that the world should be different, that we should be different. And here's how heaven helps you with unrealistic expectations. Look at this last line. If you find in yourself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, and you've done it all, perhaps you were made for another world. Perhaps it doesn't matter what labels are on your marbles, how many marbles you have. At the end of the day, you were made for something greater. 
And these are good. You can enjoy them. But they are not the ultimate meaning of life. Doesn't that speak true to you? It speaks true to me. It speaks that there's deeper things in this world. And here's how that's helpful. As you go to Thanksgiving, there's a longing for all of us for a family that doesn't fight. You're probably not going to visit them this week. (laughs) And here's how heaven helps. That longing for a family that reconciles and loves and doesn't fight, God put that longing in you. A world where people don't fight. And he says, one day I will take you there. And I've made a way for you to see it and to find it. You don't need to get rid of that longing. But honestly, you're probably not going to have it while you're living in the dungeon. So when you go home and people are bitter and Peter are mean and people uh, you know, get out of wax and you go, huh, it's just marbles. It's just marbles. In heaven, what's wrong with them will be fixed. In heaven, what's wrong with me will be fixed. You can keep the longings and imagination while applying it to now and saying, you know what, I do want the perfect dad, but he's probably not going to be perfect this side of heaven. I do want a mom who could say these words, but my mom, for whatever reason, just does not have the ability to encourage. I still need that. And so God says, let me be your encourager. When she gets to heaven, I'll work out some of that. And in the meantime, if, if, if you will open yourself to God working, he'll allow heaven to come on earth, as Jesus says. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You begin to take the values of heaven and apply it to your life and apply it to your family and apply it to your expectations. Disappointments, just marbles. Your car, did you get in a wreck? It's it's, it's bad. It's just marbles. Your house, just, just marbles compared to what you were made for. Heaven overpowers and overcomes your unrealistic expectations that you can somehow get out of your car or your job or your sex life everything you need to exist. They're all good. But they're just marbles. Nando Parada crash landed. He was unconscious in the snow, in a coma, they say, for three days with snow around him. His fellow passengers left him for dead. Three days later, he awakened, crawled his way up, his head, skull all bashed in. You're alive! Yes! He was so determined to get home that he led a group of survivors up 17,000-foot mountain. They get to the top, assuming that there's just a village over top. As they get to the top of the mountain, they look down, they're like, There's no village in sight. So he will lead this group of people. They left some behind. They were going to send a rescue party. And they traveled, had been in a coma, having not eaten, having just traveled up to 17,000 feet. He will walk 45 miles through the ice-cold snow. And when he eventually got to civilization, they said, How did you do it? What was the driver? And he said, I can only describe it this way. I had an indestructible longing for home. And as he came home, he then had an indestructible desire to go and rescue those who were still lost and tell them about home and how to get home. That's the message of heaven. That's the message of Christmas. We were designed for an indestructible longing for home. And this home is not the prison we live in. The last thing that heaven overcomes is the joy can overcome fear. The joy can overcome fear. Imagine this. You get a phone call from Bill Gates. And Bill Gates wants you to meet him in Silicon Valley. He comes into your office and he says, I'm doing something kind of strange. He said, but I want you to know that I've decided to adopt. Invite invite Dan, come up if you want. Adopt? I'm 50. I know. But I want to adopt you. Okay. What does that mean? You're going to be an heir to all my fortunes and all my business. Oh, really? I'm listening. What do I need to sign? He speaks of the riches you have. He speaks of the relationship you're going to have. He's going to mentor you during the rest of your career. He speaks of that when he dies, he's going to leave you an heir to his fortune. Wow! You leave his office. You come out, step in your taxi, you're you're going to head home and tell your spouse about it. You get in the taxi and all your foot steps in the mud, ruining your good shoes. Ah. You hop in the taxi, you're on the airport, you get to the airplane, you sit in your seat, you go along, the stewardess comes by and you say, hey, I really like some peanuts. We're out of peanuts. No peanuts! Oh, man. 
You get off the plane, you land home, you call your wife, your husband. What are you going to talk about? The mud? The peanuts? Or the fact that you are heir to one of the most richest people in the world? The identity of being adopted as an orphan into riches overwhelms the peanuts and overwhelms the mud. God says, and that's the story of adoption, the king comes to the orphan and says, I want to adopt you. I want to invite you into my family. And you are now heir, is what the Bible describes, when you follow Jesus. You're an heir, a joint heir with Christ. To the riches, not of Bill Gates. He's a marble compared to the riches of the king of kings in this realm that he speaks of. And then he says to you, hey, while you're living on earth, I want to give you some fake money. It's Canadian money. Because it's just silly. It looks like Monopoly money. But I want you to know, look at the portal. I have secured for you in heaven your real riches where not moth, not rust can ever destroy. All your real riches are secure in a, a vault. And while you're living on this vacation that's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, it's going to be mud, it's going to be no peanuts, it's going to be a dungeon at times, I want you to use the Canadian money I have that has George Washington on it here in America. Use that to advance my kingdom. Use that to advance my strategies. Use that to tell people about heaven on earth. And if you lose it, know your real stuff secure. Don't find your identity in your funny money. Find your identity in home. Home. An indestructible desire for home. That's what it means to be homesick for heaven. It says, God, I want to go home. I want to live home's values here. I want to go home to a place of adventure. I want to live that adventure now as I await. I want to go to a place of home with perfect love, a place that's pain-free, a place of joy, a place with a real body, a place of ultimate peace. A longing for home. One of my favorite songs is by Michael Bublé, and it's called Home. As you listen to this music, it can be just as true as a scientific journal. Just as true as archaeological evidence. It speaks to deeper longings for a home that we've never seen. Well, let me pray for us, and maybe you want to get in touch with that longing. Maybe you want to pray to God in these words. God, I've got a longing for something more. And I want to go on a quest to find out what that is. God, I need something that can overcome my sorrow and grief. And I want to start searching, looking, believing, and comparing my sorrow now to future ultimate joy. You're going to say, God, help me. Thank you for coming to earth. Forgive me for my own brokenness. And help me to see my relatives this week for their brokenness. To accept them where they are in the same way you accepted me. Save me from unrealistic expectations that a clean house defines me. That happy parents define me. But Father, I need a Father who is perfect. Because that's what I long for. I long to be in heaven with you. And I long to bring heaven to earth in this life you've given me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for uh, joining us for our first part of Christmas Quest as we journey to heaven. Thanks for being here. If you came prepared to give, there's some offering boxes on the way out. Otherwise, we'd love to see you. Third door on your left is the hearth room. We'd love to say hi. Thanks for being here today.